evening so we are starting at another session of the great ams trivandrum chapter program i'm really glad to welcome you all for this uh, talk on tuberculosis tomorrow is the national tuberculosis day actually we are planning to conduct it on the national tuberculosis day but due to some reason we had to prepone it by one day and we have the best person to tell us about tuberculosis i'm sure this is going to be a great session very interesting and informative program and now i am i'm not wasting much time i welcome dr g s vijay krishnan our president the imh random branch who is giving all the support and he makes it a point that in all the ams sessions and giving the right direction all the time i welcome you dr vijayshan and dr altaf the secretary of imh random branch i'm really glad to welcome dr altaf to the session thank you sir and as i said earlier we have the best person a great academician a great teacher dr sanjeev nayar to teach us about tuberculosis he is the additional professor of department of pulmonary medicine government medical college trishu he is the chairman the sonal task force for medical colleges of ndep of south zone that includes kerala tamil nadu andaman and nicobar and puducherry he is also the chairman state working group for latent tb infection kerala subject expert national technical expert group ndep he is also the member of global burden of diseases and chronic respiratory diseases group india and he is a vice chair of academy of pulmonary and critical care medicine he is not new to uh, the ams platform this is the second time he is coming as a faculty in our program i remember that he uh, participated and he presented a very good journal article that was well appreciated by everyone now probably uh, i'll be troubling him again uh, uh, in some time in july i really welcome i'm really glad to welcome you sir dr sanjeev nayar thank you sir thank you and dr shamim is a very active member of our imh trivandrum branch he is a pulmonologist of uh, sk hospital and naya medicity welcome dr shamim he'll be handling the discussion part thank you sir i don't have to welcome dr anand marthanda pillai he's a convener of a master vandram chapter he's an interventional cardiologist at sandavari hospital trivandrum i think he is here to join he will be joining within within a short time and i am really glad to welcome you all all the senior leaders dear ams members and all other participants to this program now i request dr vijayakrishnan to say a few words over to you dr gs vijayakrishnan thank you sir a respected secretary of ime trivandrum to kaltaf ams chairman dr pradeep kadangur convener dr anand marthanda pillai dr shamim the coordinator of the program respected faculty dr sanjeev nayar senior members and dear friends tomorrow the world is going to commemorate the world tb day march 24 you know 
This is the date in 1882 when Dr. Robert Koch announced his discovery of mycobacterium tuberculosis. And way over, we commemorate, commemorate this day to educate the public about the impact of tuberculosis around the world and also to sensitize medical professionals about the latest guidelines about TB management and its elimination. So IMA Trivandrum is conducting different programs in connection with World TB Day. After today's CME, tomorrow, we are going to conduct a public program at Gandhi Park East Fort, along with Anandaburi Lions Club. This year's theme for World TB Day is, yes, we can end TB. So I met Vandam is taking up this challenge and along with Anandaburi Lions Club, we are launching a year-long program aimed at eradicating TB. So tomorrow, this project will be inaugurated by Honorable Minister for Education and Labor, Sri Srivankuti. I request your presence for the program. The program will start at 6 p.m. at Gandhi Park, East Fort. Under the banner of AMS of Trivanda Branch, one more program is scheduled on 25th of March at 6.30 p.m. at Residency Hotel, Press Club Road, Trivanda. It's a workshop on basic pulmonology, including hands-on session. On behalf of AMS, Chapter of IMA Trivanda, I request your presence in this meeting also. And I request you to register through the link shared through our WhatsApp groups. The registration is totally free, but it is mandatory. And escort a Kerala State Medical Council one hour CME credit also. Today's CME on recent updates on National Tuberculosis Elimination Program, the faculty is none other than Dr. Sanjeev Nayar the additional professor of the Department of Pulmonary Medicine, Government Medical College, Trishur. So all my best wishes for this program. And before concluding, I would like to thank the Academy of Medical Specialties of Tawanda Branch Chairman, Dr. Pradeep Kadangursar, Convener, Dr. Anand Marthanda Bullay, and the coordinator for this program, Dr. Shamin for all these efforts in conducting this program. Thank you, JIME. Now I request Dr. Altaf, the Secretary of IMA Trivandrum, to say a few words. Over to you, Dr. Altaf. Thank, thank you, sir. The respected uh, IMA Trivandrum branch president, Dr. G.S. Vijayakrishnan, Chairman of IMA AMS Trivandrum, Dr. Pradeep Kadangu, uh, Dr. Anand Martarambilla, convener of AMS, and Dr. Shamim, convener of the program. As you know, Tomorrow is the World TB Day, and regarding the disease, as you know, this is the most killer disease in the world. And since 2000, actually in 2021 alone, one crore new cases detected and 16 lakhs deaths occurred. Almost every minute, one life is, uh, uh, one person is killed due to this disease. And since 2008, yes, uh, since the start of Millennium Development Goals, we have uh, the world community were able to save almost 7.5 crores lives. So that was uh, that showing the success of these TB control programs. And right now, the entire world entered into the last leg of this TB control, TB elimination phase. And in India also, we are uh, nearing to the elimination of TB as part of the Sustainable Development Goals. 
and which we set uh, to 2025 to eliminate TB in India. And I wish all success for this program. Also, congratulate Dr. Pradeep Kadangur for organizing this program, Dr. Shamim also for organizing and uh, planning this program. Uh, also, Dr. Sanjeev Nayar, the, one of the best faculty available in this state in this uh, topic. Thank you and uh, wish you all the best. So now we'll be starting the academic session. Uh, I invite Dr. Sanjeev Nayar to start the uh, session. Over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, respected uh, senior leaders of IMA and IMA. Uh, senior faculty person in the meeting. I can see some of my seniors, uh, pediatrics, uh, Dr. Pushyotam and Dr. Nisha, from uh, public health side, Dr. Vasantha Malika, Dr. Alta, my friend uh, Kartika, uh, from pulmonology side, Shamim. So, you know, we have entire spectrum of specialists also present, uh, which is a pleasant surprise for me. In fact, I was discussing with Dr. Pradeep on, you know, how much time I would get, you know, that was what we were discussing in the morning. So, in fact, when he told me the initial time, I was thinking of reducing my slides, uh, but he said, okay, you'll be a bit relaxed and take a bit of time. So, I tried to cover the entire gamut of uh, tuberculosis, but now seeing all the seniors, I feel that a bit inadequate that, you know, I left out a bit of public health, which we've discussed more, I left out uh, pediatrics, I have not put in much, but then, you know, the time is limited and whatever little time we have, uh, we cover what we can for that today. But I'm open to questions on whichever aspect of TB that we can discuss later. Let me share my slides with your permission. I hope the slides are visible. Yes. Yes, yes sir. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so the topic given to me is recent updates on NTEP, but I'm covering a bit of NTEP for the younger people who are not very familiar with what is actually happening in NTEP, and then go ahead with you know what is coming up and what is expected to come in the next few years. So that is the agenda for the day. So I'll be covering briefly the disease burden, also be covering how to disease, uh, to diagnose. Nowadays, you know, diagnosis is not just limited to TB disease. As well as about a uh, few years back, we also discussed this, uh, diagnosing TB infection, two different things how to treat TB, and for that we have treatment of drug susceptible TB and also drug resistant TB, and also TB infection, which is something that we're managing these days. And briefly here and there, I will be touching on what is upcoming, the new things which are going to come. So discussing on the burden, Dr. Alta actually covered it for you on the number of cases. You know. So large number of cases in the world actually die of tuberculosis and suffer from tuberculosis. And unfortunately, India holds the first place in all this, which is a kind of shame for all of us that, you know, our country is leading the world in the number of cases and also the number of deaths in the world. Now, about a third, more than a third of the deaths in, of the deaths in the world actually occur in India. Added to that, you have the added problem of uh, MDR-TB as well as uh, HIV-TB and also pediatric TB, children with TB is also a major crisis, where again, one third of the cases in the world are in India. So each of them have to be discussed differently, but uh, in this particular talk, I might not be able to give justice to each of those topics. What is new in the last year is that for, for after a long, long time of wishing, finally the National TB Prevalence Study report was released. For a long time, we really did not know how much of TB we had in India. We were only depending on uh, various modeling exercises done by WHO and other organizations. We had limited data on small studies done around Bangalore and Chennai by the national students. And we had one statewide prevalence study done in Gujarat. Other than that, we had no pakka data on which we could say that how much of TB we have in our country. But now that this report has come, it brings out a lot of you know, important information which can help our country and also the clinicians on how we should be managing TB. So if you look at the national TB prevalence study, what has come out is that the prevalence of TB in India is 312 per 100,000. Just more or less what we anticipate. No surprises there. So such prevalence studies can be, you know, very surprising to countries. For example, when Nigeria did its prevalence study, you know, suddenly Nigeria went to the top six countries in the world in terms of TB. Until then, we never used to even think of Nigeria. So, you know, prevalence studies can bring out startling data. It didn't really happen in India. I mean, we got 312 per 100,000, more or less what we expected. In terms of infection also, the study did bring out data. So in terms of infection, for a long, long time, we had been quoting a figure of around uh, 30, you know, 40 percent of the population being infected. But now the prevalence study says that around 32 percent of our population is infected, which is still quite high, even though you know it's slightly lower than what we had earlier. 
in terms of pulmonary tb all over the country you know the country wide uh, prevalence is as you said uh, just about 300 but when you take state wide prevalence for pulmonary tb the lowest prevalence as expected is in kerala where we had 115 per 100000 so probably you know we are better the better off than most of the other states in the country when you take the top of the list when you look at uttar pradesh rajasthan and delhi they are more or less like 100 uh, 500 per 100000 per year so they, these states have about five times the prevalence of TB as compared to Kerala. So, you know, that way, Kerala, we are much, much better off. But it also brought out, you know, certain other things that I'll be touching later. Fortunately for us, we also got some state level data. This is a study that we discussed in the previous meeting that, uh, you know, Dr. Pradeep was mentioning. We looked at the infection of tuberculosis in Kerala, where the infection in the general population among adults in Trivandrum was around 20%. So one-fifth of the population, even in Kerala, is infected. So national is 32%. In Kerala, also 20% of the population is infected, which also highlights the difficulty in dealing with tuberculosis. You know, we until recently, we were only addressing TB disease. But now that, you know, we are addressing infection, one-fifth of your population is infected. That's a huge number. And such a huge number, it's actually a bit difficult to manage, and we need specific strategies for that. Now, the interesting things that the TB prevalence study brought out is some very interesting statistics which the you know, team put up there. They put up a new indicator called prevalence notification ratio. So, for example, Kerala has the lowest prevalence in India of around 100 per lakh. But if you look at the notification of pulmonary TB in Kerala, it's only around 35 per lakh. So, you know, only one third of our prevalent cases are being notified. So, are we actually missing TB even though we have the lowest prevalence of TB? In India, have we reached a stage where we are missing TB? You know, when you have less and less of a disease, doctors also start becoming a bit complacent that they don't think of that particular disease. So it calls for some alertness. You know, we have to see whether they, we are not really missing any case of TB. The other thing is that until recently, you know, for a lot of focus on, was on uh, doing symptom screening in people and then looking for other investigations. You know, but this national program study showed that many of the patients who come are asymptomatic. So if you just, you know, do a symptom screening and you don't do x-ray, you really might miss a lot of patients. So if you're doing a field level study, looking at uh, screening, say you're going to a tribal village and doing a screening, it may not be a very perfect idea. If you just look at people who have symptoms, you may have to take chest x-rays as well, which is a big challenge, you know, going to a area and taking x-rays is not that easy. The other interesting thing, thing that came out from the study is that, you know, if you look at people with typical TB symptoms, you know, those people who should be screened for TB, when you look at it, if you look at Haryana, for example, only 12% of such patients actually approach a doctor. So they have the typical symptoms of TB, but they don't go to a doctor. On the other hand, if you take Kerala, we are much better off with about half of our patients actually going to a doctor. But even that means, even though Kerala is better off than any of the states on the list, it also means that half of the patients in Kerala who have the typical symptoms of TB actually do not go to any healthcare provider. So that also indicates that we need some kind of measures to actually get these people to get screened because if they don't go to a doctor, they don't go to a hospital and they don't get diagnosed as TB, they will actually be spreading TB at their home and in the community. With that brief summary of the epidemiology, we'll go on to the diagnosis where you know a lot of advances have come in the last few years and still more and more advances are coming. So the basics when we start with adult diagnostic algorithm for pulmonary TB, so the presumptive pulmonary TB, as we call those people who should be tested for TB, pulmonary TB, are someone with a cough of more than two weeks, somebody with a fever more than two weeks, somebody with significant loss of weight and loss of appetite, person who has uh, spitting out of blood or any lesion on X-ray. Such person is a presumptive pulmonary TB. And the investigations to do in this patient is isolating the mycobacterium tuberculosis through a microscopy, which is why we are observing you know, World TB Day tomorrow based on uh, Robert Cox's uh, discovery of the bacteria being announced. And on the other side, you take a chest X-ray. So both these investigations have to go hand in hand. So earlier, you know, in the program, chest X-ray used to be at a bit lower down the list. But today, if you take the, both the adult TB algorithm and the pediatric TB algorithm, chest X-ray actually has gone up the list. Now, once you've done these both, if your smear is positive, generally we consider that as tuberculosis, even though in many countries in the world, Today, TB due to atypical mycobacteria is more common than TB due to mycobacterium tuberculosis, some of the European countries. So a sputum positive itself may not really indicate TB in those countries. But in our country still, if a sputum is positive, we consider that as TB. If the sputum is negative, but your X-ray is suggestive of TB, then you have the next, at earlier, you know, maybe like uh, 
15 years back, such a patient, the doctor would have to take a clinical judgment whether I should start ATT or not. Today, you have the additional tests, which is called the nucleic acid amplification test. There are two types that we use. We use the TrueNAT as well as the CVNAT. So both those tests are available. There might be people whose mirror is also negative and the X-ray is also not suggestive of TB. And such people we'll evaluate for other causes. And even people who are smear positive, where you, now you're going to start treatment for TB. In today's era, you have something, you have something called universal DST or UDST, which means that you need to know the rifampicin resistant status before you start treating it. So for that purpose also, you will have to do a nucleic acid application test. Now, about a few years back itself, you have a, you know, a class of people who are called as uh, you know, special groups or presumptive MDRT. For example, somebody with the HIV or somebody with extra pulmonary TB or uh, you know, various vulnerable groups, they may directly do a nucleic acid amplification test without going through the smear and X-ray. And state also went one step ahead and got something called upfront NAD. So if somebody with all these symptoms of TB actually comes to you, you can directly do a nucleic acid amplification test, which is actually a costly proposition for the government, but the government, government is willing to invest that much of money to pick up TB early and to pick up resistance early. Now, when it comes to extra pulmonary TB, we should understand that the proportion of extra pulmonary TB has been increasing in our state and our country. And in Kerala, more than 40% of TB today is actually extra pulmonary TB. So it's a big chunk of our TB or extra pulmonary TB. Here, the symptoms are not very typical. It varies on the organ involved. So it could be a swelling in the neck or it can be the features of meningitis or the you know various, various possibilities or a back pain could be TB. So in such cases, whenever you suspect TB, the first question you ask is, is there a tissue available for testing? You know, So for example, a spinal TB, you might it might be very typical of spinal TB on your X-ray and your MRI and the treating orthopedician and the neurosurgeon and the radi radiologist might together believe that there is no need to do a surgery. Maybe you can start ATT. So in such cases, a tissue may not be available. But the commonest forms of TB, like lymph node TB or pleural effusion or many other forms of TB, often a tissue is easily available. If the tissue is available, you do a nucleic acid amplification test, histopathology, and in some of the tip, you know, uh, what we call as uh, uh, you know, precious samples. For example, if you're doing a brain surgery and taking a sample, it's unlikely that you will get one more sample if you want it later. So such cases, from the very beginning itself, you also send for a culture. So all these things can be done free of cost for your patient at the accredited labs of the girl. The other side, you might have patients with, say, a tuberculoma. The neurologist has a typical MRI finding, and he might decide that I don't want to do a brain surgery in this patient. Let me start ATT and let us see if the patient responds. In such cases, you may not have a tissue available, so these tests may not be possible. So if you've done the tests and the tests are positive, then you call it microbiologically confirmed extra pulmonary TB. If you don't have any tissue and you're not doing any test and based it on radiology or other investigations, then you call it clinically diagnosed TB. We should also understand that despite doing all the tests like nucleic acid amplification tests or your culture, some of these tests may be negative even when the patient has TB. So in such cases, you will have to clinically diagnose TB and that is also called clinically diagnosed extra pulmonary TB. So this is how we diagnose pulmonary and extra pulmonary. The more for difficult form of TB to be diagnosed is pediatric TB. That is where we miss a lot of TB because the diagnosis is not very simple now. You know, so we uh, discuss with the pediatricians, the pediatricians often discuss back with us. So there, the symptoms are more or less similar, even though fever is higher up in the list here. Persistent fever for two weeks, uh, cough for more than two weeks, weight loss, or it could be a failure to gain weight in a child, and uh, maybe a history of contact with the uh, patient who has pulmonary uh, TB in the past two years. Now, you do x-ray and then based on the x-ray, you might go ahead and do a nucleic acid amplification test either on expectorative sputum or a gastric aspirate or gastric lavage or a bronchoscopy specimen. So these are the options. And then you do a nucleic acid amplification test. And based on that, just goes like earlier, it would be microbiologically confirmed TB or if the nucleic acid amplification test is negative, Based on a clinical judgment by the pediatrician, you might diagnose, uh, you know, clinically diagnose pediatric TB. Now, what is new in this algorithm is that if you look at it very carefully, the previous algorithm in many places used to have a tuberculin skin test. In this particular algorithm, skin test or, you know, one of the, those tests are no longer available. So even in children, now the focus is on X-ray and doing nucleic acid amplification test. One of the first people to support us in this regard was Dr. Purushottaman and his team in Trishur Medical College. One of the 
things is that uh, even though the initial meta analysis and studies promise that you will get high yield in your nucleic acid amplification uh, surprisingly in kerala among the children undergoing uh, gastric class rate and uh, davaj and all the yield is not to our satisfaction often the yield is extremely low so there are a lot of proportion of cases would be diagnosed clinically so that is a problem that we have having said about all these tests i'll briefly discuss the tests we have i'm sure that you know this but you know we just again go through that so the nucleic acid amplification test there are two varieties one is the cb nat or the cartridge based nat which is a american you know technology which is available widely in india where uh, you get a sputum or a you know sample which actually is mixed with a patented reagent put into this cartridge which is there in my hand and that cartridge goes into the machine you close the door and within 2 hours you will know whether the patient has tb or not and if the patient's sample de de you know detects mycobacterium tuberculosis you will also know whether there is rifampicin resistance or not and rifampicin resistance is a surrogate of mdrt the other hand the true nat machine is a indigenously developed machine by mod biotechnologies in goa this machine is sort of semi automated that in the cb nat the entire process happens inside the cartridge and it's fully automated whereas in true nat there's a two step process where you have to isolate the you know dna and then you have to look for rifampicin resistance separately Uh, but that is also a good test which has been endorsed by w, you know who and that is also recommended particularly for pulmonary tuberculosis so both these tests are widely available a huge number of uh, cbnat labs and now prunat labs in a large number are available all over the country the entire country is covered so these tests are readily available the advantage is that they pick up tb very well and they also pick up rifampicin resistance very well so the sensitivity in smear positive tb is almost 99% and specificity is also 99% in smear negative tb you get around 70% additional yield so about 62 uh, so, so, you know 48 to 72% sensitivity is there so uh, these tests work well even in smear negative and extra pulmonary tb in extra pulmonary tb the initial who meta analysis actually showed very high positivity but then if you look at it carefully these positivity or sensitivity rates are based on a comparison with culture so if you have a pleural fluid which is culture positive which is very rare in pleural fluid it's not very 30% of your fluid will be culture positive so if your pleural fluid is culture positive then the sensitivity of uh, uh, you know your nucleic acid amplification test cb nat or true nat is somewhere around nearly 50% 43% on the other hand if you base your diagnosis on a composite reference document type lymph node comparison number of studies median pooled sensitivity median pooled specificity I'm sorry, Doctor Abhinu. You are asking a question. Okay, Hello? we'll go. Yeah, are, were you asking a question? Okay, we'll come back to that. You can ask the question later. So you know, uh, when you compare with a composite reference center, for example, the pleural effusion if it is diagnosed based on ADA and other methods, or if you base it on you know. pathology specimen and all that there the sensitivity now comes down to 17% so it's not all that good so similarly sensitivity comes down when you have in children you know the gastric aspirate uh, lavage it actually talks of 83% but i'm sure dr purushottam and dr nisha and all would disagree with this meta analysis and say that the percentages are very low so it's a very good test should be applied in all cases but don't expect extremely high positivity except for lymph node where the positivity comes and in csf it's very important because you get the results very early and it's a very serious form of tb if you get a diagnosis very early it's very useful for us the technology molecular technology which came even before gene expert or the cb nat was a line probe essay i'll not describe this technology in detail because of shortage of time at the end of whatever the process happens you get lines on a piece of paper which is read by your microbiologist to tell you one whether there is tb or not and the second thing whether there is rifampicin resistance there whether there is inx resistance and all that the problem with this is you know uh, it works only in smear positive specimens and if the specimen is smear negative the microbiologist has to do a culture and the culture isolate actually goes into the line probacy the other issue is that uh, unlike for rifampicin resistance the inx uh, you know the sensitivity is only around 72% so around uh, 28% of the inx resistance can be missed now you also have the second line version available and you have the version for the second line anti tb trials testing is also there which can test for fluoroquinolones and second line injection which actually helps us because we get now with the line probe essay i can get resistance to inh i can get resistance to rifampicin i can get resistance to fluoroquinolones 
I can get resistance to second line injectables. I can get resistance to ethionamide. So for about five drugs, I know the resistance pattern by this test, which if it uh, specimen is mere positive, the result can come in three days. But if the specimen is mere negative, then it takes a bit of time. It may take up to two months for the results to come. Solid culture was a traditional culture that was done. The LJ media, you might remember those green colored, you know, culture slopes. But now uh, the country has almost fully moved to liquid culture. So you have these MGIT machines, mycobacterial growth indicator tube machines, which can do this particular machine that you saw, see on the screen, can handle 960 specimens at one time. And the positivity can come in 7 to 14 days. In almost 10 days, you can get a positive in this uh, technology. Of course, negative still needs about six weeks for the negative to be declared. So positives can come early, but negatives take a bit of time. It is a, you know, it needs a lot of uh, infrastructure and all that. I'll not go to the details of that. But this technology is very important because for resistance for some of the other drugs, like linozolid or forbidaculin or pyrazinamide and all, can come only in liquid culture. So you can't base it on uh, solid culture. I mean, sorry, on molecular technology. And also to follow up patients, if you're following up a patient on treatment, you cannot do a molecular test because the molecular test cannot differentiate between live bacteria and dead bacteria. So even if your patient is getting cured, if you do a gene expert, it may still come as positive and it can be misleading for you. So if your patient is on treatment, say for four months, and now you want to evaluate whether the patient is actually responding to your treatment or not, don't do a molecular test. For that, you have to do a culture. So the culture is also available. Now, with all this, you know, you have a long list of tests for tuberculosis, but the thing here is that many of those tests should not be used for the diagnosis of TB. For example, the tuberculin test and the contiferon TB gold, which will be discussed later in this presentation as tests for TB infection, should not be done if your purpose is to diagnose pulmonary TB or extra pulmonary TB or pediatric TB. So, you know, the tests are for TB infection. If you want to find out infection in adult and infection in a child, those are the best tests to do, but don't do it if you're aim is to find out whether it's pulmonary TB or a lymph node TB and things like that. Some of the tests which are being over-prescribed and patients' money being wasted have been banned, but some very good tests are still available. So again, re-emphasizing that the tuberculin test or the IGRA should not be done to diagnose active TB disease, and they cannot also rule out active TB disease. So to keep that in mind. And now in a, we are in an era of plenty. You know, So you have all these molecular tests available, the gene expert, the expert XTR, Provenat, Line Probe SA, and solid culture, liquid culture, as a phenotypic test. All these tests are available for drug resistance as well. And there are so many choices that you know you, you are spoiled for choices, and so many things can happen. So the various variants of uh, the expert cartridge are available, the Truenat is available, Line Probe SA is available, and even whole genome sequencing is available, where the entire genome of the mycobacteria is uh, you know mapped out and based on that. And you get so much of information out of it, such huge you know, information that the microbiologist cannot process it. You actually need data scientists who actually process the data. So engineers have come into the diagnosis of uh, you know, TB and TB resistance. So we come into era like that. So the expert cartridge has been expanding. You have the ex expert ultra cartridge. You have the expert uh, XDR cartridge. I'll briefly tell you about it. And then you have the Omni okay. machine. It's a battery operated machine, which can be taken out anywhere in the periphery. So the ultra is a cartridge with higher sensitivity. So in pediatrics or in extra pulmonary TB, you get negative uh, with your traditional test when even when the patient has TB. So to overcome that, the company came out with a new test called ultra. But the problem is that even though the sensitivity is higher and you pick up more positives, because the specificity is lower, you get a large number of false positives. I'll not go into the details. It's only suffice to say that the number of false positives is so high that it is often Difficult to justify going into a test which has higher sensitivity and can give you more diagnosis. So this particular test has not been endorsed by the NTEP. Uh, we don't prescribe ultra, but you know the problem is that many of the private labs in our state actually give ultra. That leads to a problem because patients might come with ultra result even though the NTEP is not endorsing ultra. I'll just stop at that on this. The other cartridge is MDR, uh, MTB, XDR cartridge. So I was talking about line probe assay, which can tell you INH, fluoroquinolone resistance. But usually, you know, if you need a culture, it comes only in two months. The result takes so much of time. But whereas this cartridge can give you that same information in two hours. <coughs> Sorry. So because of this, this is a test that we are eagerly walking forward to. Some of the newer regimes that I will discuss later actually need a fast 
fluoroquinolone resistance and all to be known. So in that context, we need uh, these cartridges. So sooner or later, the program may actually endorse. WHO has already endorsed the cartridge. The new kid on the block, which excites everybody, is whole genome sequencing or next genome sequencing or you know uh, various uh, sequencing methods where the mapping of the TB DNA <laughs> is done. And based on that, various conclusions can be made. The program has six machines like that in the government. And it is basically used for finding out which are the common strains in the country, who has infected whom, and less commonly for finding out drug resistance. But the problem today is many private players have come in the market and they are offering it at reasonable rates. So a practitioner is you know, often tempted to use this test because they come and promise you that we look at the whole genome of mycobacterial tuberculosis and give you results like this, you know, which covers all the drugs and give you a result on all the drugs. And it looks very exciting. But these tests are yet to be validated in India. So as of now, you know, if a private practitioner actually does this test and all these results come, I will take it with a pinch of salt because the drugs are in my control and give drugs to the patient. I would repeat all the tests and I will not base my, you know, issue of drugs based on a technology, even though this is a technology, it's a good technology and it might be the technology of the future. So the sensitivity, promise sensitivity and specificity for various drugs with this technology is very good by the company, but it has to be validated by independent sources. Now with the availability of all these tests, you know, you have a very complicated algorithm. And that particular algorithm uh, is a bit difficult to describe on this, but it leads to the various regimes that I'm going to tell you later. So this algorithm has, I kind of simplified it, that uh, uh, as I told you, you have something called universal DST, which means that every TB patient in India today has to has the right to know their rifamicin resistance status. So if you're treating a TB patient without the attempt to find out their rifamicin resistance, that is an incomplete management of that patient. So you do a nucleic acid amplification for all your TB patients to get a rifamicin resistance status. So the result can be that rifamicin resistance is detected, in which case you have a reflex testing with the first line LPA for INH and rifamicin and ethinamide, the second line LPA for fluoroquinolone and second line injectable. And a you know, liquid culture for linozolid, clofazimin, bidaculin, pyrazinamide, delaminate, wherever it is available. So all these tests are reflexly done for your patient. And then you decide whether you give a long regime or a short regime based on the resistance pattern. There was a time when, you know, maybe like 10 years back when I would teach MBBS students and I would tell them that it is unfortunate that we are in India where we are treating patients without knowing the you know, resistance pattern fully. And if I was in the US of A, you know, I would know the resistance pattern for all these drugs and start treatment for my patients. Today, you know, I can proudly say that even in my own patients, I am doing the entire resistance pattern right based on all those uh, things. Uh, so my diagnosis today is equivalent to any other developed country in the world, and I'm giving the best possible diagnosis for my patient. <clears throat> now, if rifamicin resistance is not detected, now you want to find out whether INH resistance is detected. And for that, you do a first line LPA, which actually tells you INH resistance detected or not. If it is detected, you have a regime for you know, INH resistance. And if it is not detected, you give the drug susceptible TB regime. So this is how we decide what regime to give to our patients. Now, briefly touching on the diagnosis of TB infection, which is also something that we are managing today. So we don't test everybody for TB infection. We might be having about 60 lakh people with TB infection in Kerala. We don't have the resources to test for everybody. So we test only select groups. Household contacts are tested. Uh, you know, people with specific requirements like going in for organ transplantation or say a rheumatoid arthritis, going in for anti-TNF drugs or a patient with silicosis or, you know, uh, uh, so all such patients, a small group of patients are only tested because those are the ones at the highest risk of progression. If you want to do a testing, the traditional tests available are the working skin tests and the IGRA. But the program recommends a, either of these tests. You can do either of these tests. But the problem is that the tuberculin test, the reagent has not been available in the country for the last 20 years. Having said that, you just have to write tuberculin test and your patient will come back with a result, which, you know, which is magic in India that you can do a test with the reagent, standardized reagent not being available. Since that reagent is not available, when we started the program for managing tuberculosis infection in Kerala, we started with the other test called the IGRA, interferon gamma release assays, the quantiferon TB gold in tube plus is the test that we started for Kerala. The difficulty of that we'll come to later. A new test called the CTB has been validated and it's now it's currently available. So the two traditional tests, 
are the mantotes or tubercle skin tests and the IGRA or the interferon gamma release assay. The disadvantage of your tubercular skin test is that in people who are BCG immunized or in, you know, with other non tuberculous mycobacterium common in the community, you might have, uh, you know, lower specificity, you may have false positivity. And also it's a complex old product, very difficult to de develop, but it's good for using in the field and the cost is low, but it is not really available for us. The other side, the IGRA are very good because the specificity is high, even when the patient is BCG vaccinated and all that. The problem is that it's a very complex test. It needs a lot of laboratory support and the samples have to reach the lab within eight hours. Otherwise, the test may not really be valid. So the new test, the CTB actually covers for the disadvantages of uh, both the tests. It's a skin test, which is easily done in the periphery. So your field worker can actually do it. It uses the same antigens as your IGRA, so the ESAT-6 and the CFP-10. Because of that, it is very specific. And also, you know, it's cheaper than the IGRA. So this is going to be the test of the future. ICMR validation study is over. Half the cases done in the validation study, about 1,000, 1,200 cases were from Kerala. So the validation study is more applicable to Kerala than to any other state in India. And uh, the DCGI has approved the drug. So the government of India is into the process of procuring the drug. And once that is procured, it will soon be available for all of us. So we are all eagerly looking forward for this test to be available. Having said that, we have to really understand that there are two different entities, TB infection and TB disease. Now, infection is when the patient has no, it's not a patient. The subject has no symptoms. All the investigations for disease like x-ray, sputum, histopathology, radiology, everything is negative. Investigation for infection are positive. And the investigation for infection are either a IGRA or a skin test like uh, if your tuberculin is available, tuberculin or CT. On the other hand, active TB is considered when the patient has any of the symptoms that we discussed earlier. And here the investigations are to pick up the disease like an X-ray or microscopy or nucleic acid amplification test or histopathology or radiology and all. Any of these tests are positive. The investigation for infection like CTB or IGRA should not be done to diagnose disease. So that has to be very clearly understood. Otherwise, we'll be in trouble. Now, moving on to the last part of my presentation, which is the treatment. Currently, treatment regimes are very small in number. I say this because at one time, like four years back, there were like 15 to 17 regimes for my postgraduate students to study. Today, there are only like four regimes to study. So life is much simpler for PG students. And uh, you have one regime for drug susceptible TB, another regime for INH monopolyresistant TB. That is the INH resistant TB without rifamycin resistance. The INH monopolyresistant TB is a six-month regime without an intensive phase and a continuation phase with levofloxacin, rifamycin, ethamidrome, and pyrazinamide. Then you have two regimes for MDR-TB, a shorter regime and a longer regime. Earlier, these regimes used to have injection canamycin and all, which used to be taken for six months. But today, all these regimes are oral regimes. And the new drug, bidacolin, is present in both these regimes. So it's a very costly drug, which is given free of cost to your patient. And the drug is available free, both for the government doctors and the private doctors. Only thing is, it is not available to purchase. It is not there in the open market. There's an experimental regime called the BPAL regime, which is also available for a very small proportion of patients under very strict support. Now, the drug susceptible TB, like we said earlier, NAT is done, rifamicin resistance is not detected, plus line LPA is done, INH resistance is not detected. And in such a patient, you give a uh, regime of six months where the first two months have INH rifamicin, pyrocinamide, and tambutol, and the next four months have INH rifamicin and tambutol. It is a weight based, you know, fixed dose based regime where each fixed dose combination has INH 75, rifamicin 150. Uh, pyrazinamide 400 and ethambutol 275. And based on the weight of the patient, you either give two tablets, three tablets, four tablets, five or six tablets. When you give six tablets, the dosage is quite high. If you look at it, 900 milligram of famazine, 450 of INH, uh, 2400 of pyrazinamide and 1650 of ethambutol, it's quite high. But people are taking this dosage and that is the dosage which is required all over the world. This is what is given. We should understand that the commercial brands which are available in the market may not always match the uh, government drug dosage and for consumer protection issues and all, always go with the recommended dosage, which is what the government provides. So the algorithm, as I described earlier, it actually brings you to the treatment. So if your patient has rifamicin resistance detected, you have to decide between the shorter regime and the longer regime. The preferred regime is the shorter regime, except for pediatrics where you don't give a shorter regime, you might go directly to the longer regime for very small children. 
Now, how do you decide whether to give the shorter regime, which is the preferred regime or the longer regime? You look for certain exclusion criteria. So if the patient has been exposed to the drugs earlier for more than one month and you don't know the resistance pattern or if you have any, you know, toxicity for a particular drug, because the shorter regime is an all or none regime, you can't modify. So if you cannot give any of one of the drugs of that regime, you have to go automatically to the longer regime of 18 to 20 months. Severe forms of TB like extra pulmonary TB, children, pregnant lactating women and all, you have to go with the longer regime. Now, those are the regimes currently available. Very interesting regime, but that is not enough. Even a 9 to 11 months shorter regime is not considered short now. The world is looking at even shorter regimes. So, for drug susceptible TB, now you have a four month TB regime, which has been endorsed by WHO. So, you know, two months of uh, INH, rifapentin, pyrazinamide, and moxifloxacin, followed by two months of INH, rifapentin, and moxifloxacin. So, four months treatment is now considered enough for drug susceptible TB. This regime has not come to India. It might take a bit of time because of, you know, cost and drug requirements. But if you look at the U.S. guidelines this year, USA has actually recommended this regime. And now patients in the USA with drug susceptible TB may get a four-month treatment. Now for MDR-TB, you have these six-month regimes. One is a BPAL-M regime. There's another regime called the BPAL regime. And there's a new study done from India called the BEAT study done by NIRT Chennai, which again has a shorter regime, which, you know, has lesser number of drugs, short, shorter duration of treatment, which makes it easy for your patient. So newer options are still coming. These have to be included in the program. WHO has endorsed all these regimes, but you know our country has to adopt it. It might take a bit of time. I'm just telling you that there are still you know exciting things to look for in the future. Now for TB infection, internationally there are WHO actually recommends six regimes: six months of INH daily, nine months of INH daily, three months of INH and uh, rifampicin daily, three months of INH and rifapentin given once weekly for three months, 12 doses, one month of uh, rifapentin plus INH given daily for one, you know, just for a month, and four months of rifampicin given daily. So all these options, six options are there. But in our state, the treatment that we give for latent TB or TB infection is either six months of INH, which we give in HIV positive people, Three months of INH and rifampicin, which we give to all children below the age of 15 years. This is daily for three months. And then three months of INH and rifampicin is what we give to adults, uh, both contacts as well as those special groups who, are, who, can, who need the drug. And uh, this is a once weekly thing. So they just have to take 12 doses. If the patient's index case or the person who has actually infect, probably infected that person has INH resistance, you can give four months of rifampicin. If they have rifampicin and INH resistance, then you can give six months of levofloxacin. This is not really implemented in Kerala, the last two, but the first three are already available in Kerala and we are guidely giving it to our patients. So to conclude, it's an exciting time for all of us. We have more knowledge of the epidemiology of uh, TB in India and in Kerala. So public health experts like uh, Altaf and Kartika and all will be looking at this TB prevalence report very closely and guide the government on how to change strategies and also guide clinicians on how they should approach that patient differently. There is widespread availability of newer diagnostics tests, which is which makes life simple for us, but also a bit difficult to interpret many of these tests. And to make it difficult for us, even newer tests are coming, which you know often clinicians jump to those tests, and then we are in trouble trying to interpret those tests. You have those, you know, FDC-based, weight band-based uh, regimes for drug susceptible TB for six months currently. And then you have these bidacolin containing regimes, the short regime and the longer regime, very costly to us even free of cost to your patients and even newer regimes are now in the pipeline. Sooner or later, they will also come to India. So, you know, we are exciting, excited about all these new possibilities that might happen, which may be seen by our patients. Thank you for the patient listening. As many of the uh, leaders who inaugurated today said that working together, yes, we can end TB. And uh, it's a shame for us that we still have so much of TB. I'm sure that we can work together and get rid of this, uh, you know, difficult illness that our people suffer. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you. Uh, now I invite Dr. Shamim to start the discussion part. Dr. Shamim. Thank you, sir. It was a great talk. Uh, big topic cannot be simplified more. So we'll go into a discussion. Any questions from the audience? Okay, so uh, probably I can invite a comment from Bushotaman, sir, if he's still there. Pediatric. Uh, the pediatric, Matt, you know, we have discussed this a lot. Uh, so the last time I went to a hospital for a talk, 
all the pediatricians kind of surrounded me and said that the test is not giving enough results why are we sub subjecting our children to you know difficult invasive procedure like gastric lavage should we actually change the guidelines so at that time we could not discuss much but we have a lot of evidence coming from kerala today on extra pulmonary tb from kims troandrum from uh, murda from uh, lissi and all which actually shows that the nucleic acid application test is working very well even better than what was promised in uh, extra pulmonary tb so just for pediatric tb it is low and at national level when i attend meetings i am told that you know maybe there are methods for increasing the yield in uh, pediatric tb so any comments on that uh, 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 sanjeev as you said it was a very informative talk and uh, uh, on the tb day uh, i have got a request to the uh, ima because i heard a video a message from uh, dr sulfi today what i request is uh, the 30000 40000 uh, ima members in kerala and at the national level it should take a decision to stop or reduce the use of linezolid and these uh, fluoroquinones because as you said uh, the resistant uh, drugs we are going to make use of the fluoroquinones moxifloxacin and all and uh, linezolid also both these are oral the oral preparations it is available freely and unlike the antibiotics which are over the counter preparation this is uh, got got only by the prescription so if ima take a firm stand to uh, avoid these two group of drugs on the tb day and give that message include that message on the tb day to the entire state or maybe the national level also this is relevant that is one point for the whole ima my request second thing sanjeev as a national program and we are going to implement this thing with the public private participation and as any other public private participation only when we implement you will know there are a lot more of difficulties occurring here there's the solutions need to be found out for the financial aspect of the many of these things because there will be difficulty for the the private institutions when it is implemented a government program implemented maybe you you, you can supply the igra uh, thing because which, which is being done in the private institution many of them and uh, we are doing an ms medical college now and uh, we are finding it difficult how to include them because the uh, our is an, the, the the electronic uh, method of the op ticket uh, generation there they need to uh, give money so that, uh, that that should be a policy by the administrators a lot of difficult decisions there who will pay for that the second one before you start the drug we need to do the hiv status lft baseline test and on the follow up also we need to do the the lft the monitoring of the adverse uh, drug reactions so and uh, many of the situations there may be in between imaging other tests should be done the financial aspects and the logistics the, the the blocks need to be addressed and that should be discussed at the national level when it is implemented the, with the help of the private uh, uh, say, sector that is the one point thank you sir thank you uh, sanjeev sir one question so one of the biggest concerns when we change from Uh, intermittent regime to the daily fdc was uh, drug toxicity mainly hepatic toxicity how common is it after your experience uh, uh, drug induced hepatitis and hepatic toxicity in this new fdc combination yeah very interesting question and also comments from shotaman sir which are kind of related also uh, if you look at the national guidelines uh, Uh, the national guidelines for tb do not talk of a baseline lft and you know no follow up lft only if there are risk factors you actually supposed to do that but in kerala as expected you know so when we moved from the intermittent regime to the daily regime that was one of the demands of ima ashokan sir always would go to meetings and would request that the country should move to a daily regime to bring everyone the private sector in and the country actually accepted the ima request and we moved to a daily regime but when we moved to the daily regime we anticipated that you know drug induced hepatotoxicity which is around 0 to 1% in intermittent regime is said about to the tune of 4 to 8% in daily regime so it was expected that drug induced hepatotoxicity would go up we also expected other adverse effects like arthralgia and all to go up so that was anticipated 
And in Kerala, as expected, as soon as we started implementing, you know, we have a lot of alcohol misuse and all in Kerala. And we did have a lot of cases with drug induced hepatoxicity. So then health secretary, we were able to convince him, Mr. Rajiv Sahanandan, that we are having a lot of drug induced hepatoxicity and we should consider doing LFT free to our patients. And Kerala uh, changed from the, I mean, took a different stand from the national guidelines and all our patients in Kerala are supposedly to undergo a baseline LFT before starting treatment. And many districts are also doing follow-up LFT. Of course, that leads to the question on, uh, you know, how you do it free. So even in the government, many of the hospitals are, you know, HTC-based labs where patients actually have to pay for LFT and all. So in the private sector also, it's an issue of payment. So these are a bit complicated issues. I'll not go into a discussion on that. Very valid points raised by Pushyotaman, sir. So Dr. Shami, you might remember that uh, at a time uh, when I was doing post-graduation uh, post in Pulana Kota, if you went to the ward, you know, you see a series of patients in the ward with those hepatic drips because they had drug-induced hepatoxicity. And then I had a generation of PGs in my hospital during the intermittent era where we never saw any, you know, very few cases of drug-induced hepatoxicity to come. Now, suddenly, you know, our wards are again having a lot of drug-induced hepatoxicity. So around 2-3% mm -hmm. of patients are coming with drug-induced hepatoxicity. So you have to be careful for that because it has medical legal implications also. If you miss a drug-induced hepatoxicity and the patient becomes bad, then we'll have to face <coughs> trouble but it can be anticipated we can observe patients and if we manage it early it's not really an issue the worrying issue is you know we are having a few cases of ocular toxicity also suddenly you know i realized that you know one percent of uh, problems with vision often concerns more patients than a 50 percent risk of death so even the vision is at times more important than even dying so such things also come in and, you know, so all these ADR have to be managed. We have a plan of action. So for, again, for ocular toxicity, we have asked for evaluation of uh, patients and all those things are there in the pipeline. So all those things are being addressed. That's a very valid point. That Another question is that toxicity of newer new range of toxicity. For example, the worried toxicity of bidaculin, which did not come to the extent that we were worried about, is bidaculin toxicity in terms of cardiotoxicity. So for the first time, now our TB committees have got cardiologists sitting in that. So first time when we invited cardiologists, they asked what have we got to do with TB? And then he said, we are giving this drug called bidaculin, delaminate and all, which are very good drugs, but they are uh, having QT segment prolongation. So that is something new. Linazole, it causes a lot of uh, peripheral neuritis, which is extremely disturbing. You know, severe peripheral neuritis, uh, through pancytopenia and all can occur in your patients with linazole. Linazole is a very difficult, very effective drug, but has, uh, you know, when given in the long term, has a lot of toxicity. Uh, so all these, uh, you know, second line drugs have their own toxicity. The patient with MDR-TB, we observe even more closely the pretreatment evaluation, which has to be done before starting treatment is even more, you know, uh, elaborate when you're managing a patient with drug resistance. For drug resistant TB, at least, you know, the pretreatment evaluation is fully free and everything is provided by the program. For drug sensitive TB also, what Pushyotam and Sir said, the LFT and all should be free, but a high proportion of those patients, drug resistant TB is only around less than 200 cases every year in Kerala. So giving everything free is easier, but for the drug sensitive TB, which is like around 30,000 patients every year in Kerala, with maybe 40% of them going to the private sector, so around 12,000 patients in the private sector, uh, significant proportion of them might be paying for their services. So that is something that uh, he is rightly pointing out that uh, the program managers have to address. Is inpatient uh, treatment required for MDR patients? No, no, no. When we started the MDR program way back in 2008, so we were admitting patients at least for, you know, initially in the start, we were admitting for one month and later for one week when we started the regime for looking at all these toxicities. But then we realized that toxicity is not very common and we can manage patients at home. So, uh, you know, uh, these patients are now managed at home and uh, OP basis. So uh, only if they have adverse effect or they have a severe illness which requires admission, they are admitted. I think somebody asked a question on bidaculin frequency of management. So I think uh, bidaculin, you know, the ECG is the, initially when we started with bidaculin, we were so worried that in the beginning we were taking daily ECGs. And then we re realized that daily ECGs are not required. So you take a ECG at the beginning and then at the end of uh, two weeks and then afterwards every month you take a ECG and uh, QT segment prolongation can be picked up in that. So that is only the frequency which is needed. Okay. Any other question?
So what's the uh, current status of Manto test? Because we are getting many uh, for extra pulmonary TB, pediatric cases. That so for pediatric TB, I appreciate I, IAP that uh, they, if you read the current IAP guidelines, there is no Manto mention anywhere. So the just immediate previous uh, IAP or NTP guideline used to have a typical test also mentioned. So the country managers are in a dilemma because the country guideline itself says that you have to do a Manto and the solution was not available. The latest 2022 IAP NTP consensus algorithm does not have a Manto anywhere. So, you know, even in pediatrics, extra pulmonary, definitely there is no point in doing a Manto. I have a lymph node in my neck. If you do a Manto or a IGRA for me, it will be positive. That does not mean that you have to treat me for TB. So, you know, 20% of people like me in Kerala will be positive if you do a IGRA or a Manto. And all of us sitting in this meeting will be positive. So, you know, just because we have a back pain or a neck node or something like that, a lesion on an X-ray, just because we do a IGRA or a Manto and it's positive, we start treating, all of us will be on treatment every day. So that those tests are not for disease, but if at all you didn't have Manto, it is not available in India, standardized tuberculin, which IAP guidelines even earlier used to insist that you have to use only standardized solution, which has never been available for the recent past. I tried to buy it for a study from, uh, uh, from the internet and I found that uh, 10 uh, Manto vial costs about 15,000 rupees. So it's about 1,500 rupees per test. And I found my study, I could not afford such a costly test. So I, I did not buy it from the market. It was difficult to get also. When CTB comes, it will become a replacement. But again, I bring in caution that uh, don't use it left and right, just uh, using Manto because it's very tempting because another reagent is now available. So within another six months time, one year time, it will be available. But we have to be very cautious among the use that you Another one is, so I told that about registration in Nikshai is very less in Kerala. So, I mean, if the private practitioners, when they start the, on ATT patients, the registration in the Nikshai site will be, is uh, very less. That's what I feel, what we have. I, I, we always talk of Kerala as a success story. The steps model in Kerala and the IMA model of uh, private sector involvement in Kerala generally is considered as a success story at national level. We always, when we go to national meetings, we talk of Kerala having done so much as compared to many other states, like when you go to UP and all, you know, people are not even aware of uh, Nikshay and all that. Kerala generally is doing good. I'm sure that Dr. Shamim, your hospital has a step center. So many of the hospitals have step centers and uh, about 40% of our cases are notified from the private sector. Now, whether private sector is missing out on cases, I am not very sure. IMA had taken a lead, uh, you know, uh, Martha Nabilla sir and R.V. Ashugan sir at that time had taken a major lead to ensure notification of all cases. And all our doctors should be aware that notification is mandatory. It's a legal requirement. In fact, if you don't notify, you can even go to jail in addition to a fine. So that is a mandatory thing. And Niksha is a downloadable software. It's a bit difficult for a practitioner to sit and do it himself or herself. But definitely support will be there from the program. So, you know, definitely we have to notify cases. Any other questions? Okay. If there are no more questions or uh, comments, we'll wind up the session. I request Dr. Anand Martan, I wonder whether he's uh, joined or not. He's on call. He's busy in the hospital. Dr. Anand? No, I don't think he's here. Anyway, uh, uh, so, uh, thank you, Dr. Sanjeev Nair. It was a wonderful session, a really uh, an academic feast. Uh, uh, you covered everything within a very short time. Really enjoyed it. As I uh, warned you in the beginning, I've been troubling you again. And I uh, express my gratitude to Dr. Shamim for organizing um, with such a wonderful session for the discussion part. And for Dr. Pushwatavan, sir, um, uh, he's also a pediatrician like me um, for joining and uh, pointing out a few uh, very important points. And and for everyone, all the senior leaders, my dear IMA members, AMS members, and all the participants for joining us. And as our president mentioned, we have some good sessions coming up, especially on 25th, that is Saturday. We have a basic pulmonology workshop at uh, Residency Tower. That will cover the spirometry in detail from the basics and uh, inhalation therapy. And uh, there will be a hands-on session 
and that will be a wonderful program. Please do join. This is something which all of you require. All of you who, who are interested in bronchial asthma, COPD, et cetera, et cetera, please do join. Because spirometry is something most of the people, you know, uh, they are not uh, much aware of uh, how to read the things and all those stuff. Please do come and um, try to learn this. And uh, we have uh, some very good sessions coming up again next month. We'll be informing you. Please join uh, our sessions. And um, that's really a uh, help and encouragement to all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you. Good night. Good night. Good night.